in for a real treat today. I, this last spring, I was able to uh, go to the University of, well, actually, to the Minnesota High School Coaches Convention. And um, I, I was able to hear uh, this lady speak, and she is amazing, uh, as you're going to hear uh, this morning. And hopefully this will give you some information to take back to your schools and, and to really get the truth uh, behind uh, concussion research. And uh, we really, really appreciate it this morning. I think Rodney Webb's going to introduce us. It's a real treat for me to get to introduce this morning's speaker. She is a neurosurgeon and brain injury researcher from the Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's one of the, which, well, the, the center is one of the busiest level one trauma centers in the United States. Our speaker this morning is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Minnesota. She serves on the executive committee of the American Association of Neurosurgeons. Her research has been discussed in New York Times, Washington Post, Sports Illustrated, Forbes, and the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Most importantly, she's smarter than you are. I could read her accolades for an hour, but I want to give the time to her this morning. It's with extreme honor that I introduce Dr. Uzma Samadani. Thanks. I, I know one of those comments, at least, is not true. I still remember all my high school teachers and coaches, and all of them were exceptionally intelligent people. Um, they just chose to dedicate their lives to teaching people like me, so I have extreme gratitude to them. And obviously, when I look at you guys, I, I'm reminded of them, so, so don't kid yourself. Um, anyway, um, it's a huge pleasure to be here. It's my, my first trip to Texas to speak at a conference. Um, and, and so this is kind of interesting for me, and I'm also used to, generally I usually give talks at, at you know, either neurosurgery or neurotrauma conferences, and my entire audience is people who, who study brain injury. Uh, and so this is a little bit different for me. I have given some football talks, but this is, is probably the largest one. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like, you know, there are a couple of questions that people ask is why are, do I want to talk about football? You know, I mean, I study brain injury. I've been studying brain injury for 15 years. And the reason that I have, have made football an interest of mine is right here. Um, so this is my son. He's, um, he's 14 years old, and he plays uh, high school football. He's a, a kicker, mostly. Um, he tries to be a wide receiver as well. Um, and, uh, and he plays for his high school team. And obviously, when, when you, know, you have a kid, and you know, everyone loves their kid, and everyone wants their kid to do what's best for their own psychosocial development, for their athletic development, for their educational development, you know, and your kid comes to you and he says, I want to play football. You have to look it up. You have to understand the risks and benefits. And then you have to make an educated decision. And that's really why I got into this. You know, people have asked me, was I paid by the NFL? I didn't start getting paid by the NFL until way, way later. I've only been an NFL employee for one year. Um, I, I've been having my kid for 14 years, so I have a completely different vested interest in, in his development. Um, second thing that, you know, I, I'm, the second reason I'm really happy to be here is I feel like it's not really fair to you guys as coaches or lay people or parents, you know, to get your information about brain injury from the media because, you know, things are very confusing. And um, I wrote a book about brain injury. Um, it's called The Football Decision. And I, I originally had looked for a publisher, and the first publisher I approached said to me, said, you know, people who play football don't read books. Um, and, and actually, you know, obviously that's not true because I read books and my kid plays football. Um, so the, the good news is, is that Elsevier is going to publish the book. So all the information that you see in this talk, plus more information on classification of brain injury and treatment of brain injury, will be available in a textbook by Elsevier. And the textbook is being targeted to pediatricians, primary care physicians, coaches, and athletic trainers. So hopefully it'll be readable, um, you know, for everybody. Um, and that will probably be available later this fall. Um, so disclosures, um, my employer obligates that I disclose all my conflicts of interest. Um, those are my conflicts of interest. Those are all the people um, who either employ me or uh, in, in which I'm an affiliate officer, member, or consultant. Um, I also have intellectual property related to concussion and brain injury assessment. I have a startup um, and re related to assessment of dementia after brain injury, and that's in older adults. Um, so le let's get to the, the issue at hand. Um, so, as most of you know, participation in sports has declined in recent years. Um, and if you look at the groups from ages 6 to 17, based on SFIA, which is a, an organization that tracks these things, 
Um, it looks like it's declined about 10% in the last five years. So there are about 50 million kids doing sports in 2009, and by 2014 it was down to about 45 million. And it's not just football, it's a lot of different sports, it's across the spectrum. And, and really, you know, you sort of have to wonder, well, what's going on? And, you know, maybe some of it is that there are competing interests. You know, there's theater, there's other activities that, that um, you know, that overlap with the time that, you know, children would be doing sports. But also there's definitely a perception among the general public that, you know, sports might be dangerous. And, and really that's why we're here, you know. And I think the, the two biggest things that people are worried about is, number one, death. You know, death either from an injury itself or from depression leading to suicide. Um, but that's probably the, the biggest concern that people have. And then the second is long-term risk for dementia. And you know, the, the title of my talk is Myths and Perceptions, and really those, to me, are the two biggest myths and misperceptions about sports in general, is that number one, they, they can increase your risk for death, and number two, they can increase your risk for dementia. So let's go systematically and look at the data. So first of all, do sports cause death? Well, just to start with perspective here, Riding in a car um, equates to 144 deaths per million. And if you look at the, the actual numbers, it's about one fatality for every 93 million miles um, of driving. Um, and so that's, that's a fairly high number. Um, and if you, if you ride on a horse, it's 20 deaths per million, so it's about one-seventh that. And that puts it at about twice as dangerous as football. Things like biking, snowboarding, skateboarding, and skiing, all these speed sports or road sports, um, basically have a death rate of about 15 deaths per million. Um, football is about as safe as playing on a playground. Um, it has a death rate of about uh, less than um, 10 deaths per million. And then swimming is a complicated thing because swimming, it's hard to get a denominator on the number because a lot of, of drowning deaths are actually bathtub deaths or accidental immersion in a non-swimming environment deaths. And, and so that, it's harder to count, but there are about 140 pediatric deaths per year um, which is about 14-fold greater than football. So, you know, when, when you want to talk about banning sports or worrying about death in sports, you have to keep things in perspective and you have to realize that football is nowhere near the top. We're the, they're the top of the media interest. You know, when, whenever someone talks about brain injury, the first thing they do is they put up a football player. But, you know, it, it's, it's not the top of the actual statistical um, uh, in, uh, number. So what causes death from brain injury? Um, in children, in particular, it's accidents, homicide, and suicide. And accidents are overwhelmingly number one here. Accidents are actually decreasing as cars become safer. Um, homicide is obviously, you know, a, a separate issue that beyond the scope of this conversation. And then suicide is actually increasing in the adolescent population. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and, and about, you know, risk factors for that. And then, you know, people talk about, well, how can you prevent death in teenagers? Well, the number one way to prevent death in teenagers would be to prevent them from texting and driving because that kills 11 American teenagers every single day. There are more American teenagers who die in one day texting and driving than playing football for an entire year. So it's obviously a much, much bigger problem. And then the final thing here is that half of all brain trauma occurs in intoxicated people. And that um, applies to teenagers as well as adults. And that's really the common denominator for brain injury. Um, you know, if we can get people to um, control their behaviors after drinking or control excessive drinking, we could substantively change the, the demographic of brain injury. Um, and, and so now sports, you know, let's get to sports. So people are worried that um, you know, concussions are the cause of, of major, you know, long-term uh, complications, and concussions are not good for you. If you, you know, came to this talk hoping to hear me say that concussions are good for you, that's not going to happen. Um, basically, from 2004 to 2008, concussions made up about 7.4 percent of all football injuries. And, you know, the, the most common injuries in football, as you know, are the, the um, orthopedic injuries. So, um, you know, joint injuries, long bone injuries, you know, these kinds of, of injuries. But uh, obviously concussion is a concern because it has potential long-term consequences. Um, and, and all of sport can be associated with concussion. Um, as a percentage of total injury, it's actually higher for female soccer than it is for football. But you know, it's a substantive um, proportion of all types of injury. And I don't know if everyone here is you know, involved with football. I'm sure there are a lot. But you know, if there are other sports represented, um, you, know, you also have to be concerned about the same considerations. Um, so really what I study and what my lab works on and what I've worked on for the last 15 years is brain injury. 
Um, and when, when someone has a trauma, so when someone's playing sports, it's never an isolated, you know, just head injury. It's always a combination or a, what we call a polytrauma, which means the whole body gets hit. You know, when a kid goes to the ground or when a kid collides with another kid, they're not just hitting their head, they're hitting their entire bodies against each other. And so that makes figuring out what's wrong a very complex thing because there are actually many, many different things that can be wrong. So the first thing you have to think about is neck injury. So the number, um, the most common sport for causing neck injury is actually swimming and diving. That's the most common cause of paralysis. Um, equestrian is number two. Um, and then uh, you have your, your road sports, like uh, ATV sports, uh, that are, are very, very common causes of, of paralysis. So football is not in the top three for that. But where neck injuries have to come under consideration is you can have a kid who's playing football and hits their head, and then they may have a headache, they may have nausea, vomiting, they may feel really sick, they may not feel well, but they may not actually have a brain injury. They may have a neck injury that's manifesting itself with the same symptoms as a brain injury. So for example, they could have spasms in their neck, they could have um, you know, constriction of muscles in their neck that cause them to feel like they have a brain injury. And up to 17% of head injuries are comorbid with a, with a, a spine injury. Um, the second thing you have to think about when you think about the consequences of brain injuries is endocrine dysfunction. So this is classically seen in the person who's in a car accident and as, they, as they, the car accident occurs, their head impacts, they, their head bounces forward and backward. And this little gland, the pituitary gland, that connects to the hypothalamus and controls all the hormone secretion in the entire body gets sheared. And so this patient will come into the emergency room after their car accident, they'll get a CAT scan, and it'll show that nothing's wrong. They get sent home, and three months later, there's just something very, very wrong. They're depressed, they don't feel like hanging out with their friends, they may have you know, decreased sexual interest, they may have increased thirst or increased in, um, decreased ability to control their, um, their sodium regulation. You know, so, so they may have complex problems, and this can be missed. Um, and th like I said, it's classically seen with car accidents, but endocrine dysfunction is something that you, know, you definitely worry about with trauma. Um, inner ear injury, this can cause dizziness. So you don't necessarily have to have a brain injury to be dizzy. These are the kinds of problems that can be fixed with vestibular rehab. Um, cortical spreading depression, this is thought to be the mechanism of post-concussive headache. So this is the patient who, again, um, comes into the emergency department or to the pediatrician, and they're having headaches after their brain injury, and nobody really knows why. Um, and this can, they can actually get worse over time. It can cause seizures. It can cause stroke. It's not visible with any conventional imaging. It's not going to show up on CT scan. It's not going to show up on MRI scan. It is treatable. You can treat it with um, electrolyte uh, replacement like magnesium, and you can treat it with medications that restore um, the balance of electrolytes or of ions on the sides of neurons. And then finally, there's the spectrum of what I think of uh, when people think of, about brain injury. So there's scalp injury. So scalp injury, you know, the majority of people who get hit in the head um, do not actually have a brain injury. Most people will, will take most of the impact in their scalp and their skull. Um, and, and this can also cause headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. You know, this can make your kid feel very sick. Um, then there's bleeding on the surface of the brain, either above or below the dura, which is that sort of layer of, of membrane that covers the brain. There's bleeding within the brain. And then this is sort of the elephant in the room, you know, diffuse axonal injury, which is thought to be the cause of CTE. So diffuse axonal injury is when you tear neurons. And for those of you who've seen the movie Concussion, this is what Bennett Omalu and his, um, his, his neuropathology team um, claim is the number one cause of sort of dementia in football players. And we're going to talk about this in great detail because this is something that you know, is, is sort of a focus of the media. Um, and then there's anoxic brain injury. So anytime you have a, a person who has a trauma, and you know, maybe they get the wind knocked out of them and they just stop breathing, or maybe they, they, they break a leg or something like that and their blood pressure drops. Um, and, and they can have a lack of blood flow to the brain, and that can cause permanent damage. So now you're, you're probably wondering, so okay, which of these has been shown to be more common in people who play football versus don't play football? And the reality is, is that there has not been a single randomized controlled study showing that any of these is more common in football players versus people who don't play football. So despite what the media says, you know, and we're going to go through the data in greater depth, but, but that's, that's really what the reality is. Um, so let's talk about suicide risk. 
we know that concussion is associated with increased suicide risk. So this is a Canadian study. It's 235,000 patients who had a concussion. They were followed for nine years. Um, and the, the suicide rate was 31 per 100,000, which is higher than the, the mean. Um, so it's about threefold higher. So we know that having a concussion increases your risk for suicide. So then what happens in football players? So football players, one would think, would have a higher risk of suicide, but that's not true. The reality is, is that if you look at every single level, NFL, NCAA, and high school, football players do not have a higher risk for suicide. So this is a study on NFL players. It's um, 3,400 NFL players. They were studied, um, recruited over 30 years. They played a minimum of five seasons per player, and they were followed for 30 years after retirement. And their suicide rates for the players who retired since 1987 was 6.1. Since 2005, it was 12.5. And compared to the average American male, it's, which is 20.1, um, NFL players are 48% less likely to commit suicide than the general population. Um, and since 1987, they're 70% less likely to commit suicide than in general population. The other thing that this study showed was that NFL players outlive their peers in terms of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So the reality is that people think, okay, you know, if you play football, you're gonna have a higher risk for suicide. That's not true at the NFL level. Let's look at the NCAA level. So this paper was published October 2015, um, and what it did was it looked at a nine-year analysis of the NCAA resolutions um, database and if you look at the comparative level of, of suicide rate, so the general population, this is both um, male and female now. So for males, it's 20.1, but women is about fourfold lower. So for the general population, it's 12.6 per 100,000. To put this in perspective, physicians are at 28 to 40 per 100,000, with anesthesiologists being the highest. Um, and, and some people say that's because they have to deal with surgeons. Um, so. 18 to 22-year-old non-college students are at 12 per 100,000. College students, so going to college puts you at 7.5 per 100,000. Your average NCAA athlete, kid who does sports in college, 0.93 per 100,000. So playing sports massively reduces your risk for suicide, and that's true even for football. And the rates are higher here because this is male only, whereas this is both male and female. If you correct for gender, it's almost the exact same, 2.25 per 100,000. So in other words, playing football at the NFL level doesn't put you at higher risk for suicide. Playing football at the NCAA level does not put you at higher risk for suicide. Let's look at the youth level. So um, these two um, graphs are on different scales. So that's a little bit confusing, but I, it's easier to show. So this is the, um, the rate of participation in athletics, charted in blue. And as you can see, it's slowly trending down. It goes from about 50 million to 45 million over these five years. This is the suicide rate for adolescents. And it goes from about 36,000 to about 42,000 over those same five years. So in other words, the number of suicides is going up in the youth population as the athletic participation goes down. And you know, I'm not trying to say that there's causation here. I'm not trying to say that there's a relationship, but I don't need to because there's other people saying that. Um, sports participation is a protective factor against depression and suicidal ideation in adolescents, as mediated by self-esteem and social support, was published in, uh, I think this paper was published in 2013, and basically what it shows was that as high school and middle school students participate in sports, they have a decrease in depression by 25% and a decrease in suicidal ideation, which is the idea of, com of uh, committing suicide um, by 12%. So in other words, you know, we need to get the kids off their computers. We need to get them out and playing. And, and you know, anyone who tells you, well, they're, they're worried about either death or, or suicide or depression if their child plays football, you know, you can just show them the statistics and say that's not a real concern. So now let's talk about the other elephant in the room, which is dementia. Um, you know, there's, there's all this stuff in the media that basically makes you think that if your child plays football, they're gonna grow up to become demented. Um, so what's the relationship between concussion and dementia? One third of Americans have had a concussion in their lifetime. Two thirds of these are males, and that's thought to be because men are more likely to engage in risk-taking behaviors. Dementia occurs in about 63.5 per thousand persons in the United States. Alzheimer's is twice as common in women versus men. So in other words, even though men are more likely to have had a concussion, 
Women are more likely to get Alzheimer's. Five million people have Alzheimer's. There's no reliable diagnostic and has an unknown <coughs> cause. The other common causes of dementia are vascular dementia. That's the kind of dementia you get when you have high blood pressure. Um, and that, what that is is it's due to a lack of blood flow to the brain chronically. Frontotemporal dementia and normal pressure hydrocephalus. So what are the risk factors? What does cause dementia? High blood pressure is the number one reversible cause of dementia. And you know how you reduce high blood pressure? You play sports. Um, diabetes, sedentary lifestyle, increases your risk for dementia by 2.25 fold. So, you know, getting out and playing sports will reduce your risk for dementia. High fat diet, frequent alcohol use, female gender, women are twice as likely to become demented as men. Low socioeconomic status, particularly true in women. Smoking, atrial fibrillation, or any cardiac arrhythmia, genetics, um, decreased level of education is huge. Uh, as a cause uh, for dementia, particularly in men. And then there was a California epidemiologic study that showed that if you were over the age of 65 years and you had a mild brain injury, you were at increased risk for dementia. And if you were over the age of 55 years and you had a moderate or severe brain injury and you were a male, you were um, at risk for increased risk for dementia. So in other words, that relationship does not hold true if you're not um, over the age of 55. So for most of the kids that you're coaching, um, a mild brain injury, a single mild brain injury is not gonna increase their risk for dementia. And I get asked this literally every single day by my patients. Every time I see someone who comes in with a brain injury, the first thing they say to me is, you know, my kid just got in a car accident. Does this mean he's gonna grow up to become demented? And my answer is always the same thing. Well, if he becomes a hypertensive, <laughs> obese, diabetic smoker who drinks a lot, then yes. Um, you know, but, but being in a single trauma is not going to increase your risk. And then this paper just got published July 11th, which is last week. And, and what this shows, this is an amazing paper published in JAMA Neurology, the largest study ever looking at the risks of brain injury. 4,265 older adults followed for 45,000 years. And there was no association between a single brain injury and mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, or any other type of dementia. What this study did show was that there was an increased risk for Parkinson's disease and other motor disorders in people who have brain injury. So don't think that because you have a brain injury you're totally scot-free, but you are not at increased risk for dementia. So then, you know, you all have read, you know, and if you read the newspaper, if you, if you follow the news, you've all read about CTE. So if brain injury doesn't cause dementia, well, what's all this nonsense about CTE? And, you know, let's sort of look at that. So what is chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Um, and, you know, the original paper was published by a pathologist, Harrison Martland, um, in 1928, and he studied boxers. And he published it in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is a very prestigious journal. And he found that in 17% of living professional boxers um, that they had this disorder that was, that was called at the time dementia pugilistica and then ultimately became named CTE in 1969. And the disorder was characterized by motor deficits. By motor deficits, we mean coordination problems. So things like tremor, um, things like inability to, to do fast finger movements. Um, and then it was also characterized by dementia. The pathology was described in the 1960s and 1970s at Queen Square in England. So Queen Square was really the place where um, a lot of the really definitive work in neurosurgery and neurology was done, um, you know, earlier in the, in, in, the 19th, in the 18th and 19th centuries. So it was sort of like, the, you know, the, the best place to go if you wanted to study brain injury. And, and so this was all, all mostly done, you know, either in New Jersey or in England. And then what happened in the 2000s is, um, Bennett Omalu published his paper on chronic traumatic encephalopathy in a National Football League player. And this was the Mike Webster paper. And for those of you who've seen the concussion movie, this is the subject of that movie. And then a separate group in Boston published a paper on chronic traumatic encephalopathy in athletes, progressive tauopathy after repetitive injury. And what happened is when these two papers came out, there was a huge uproar in the neuropathology community. And the reason that there was this uproar was that the pathology that was described in these papers was not the same as what was originally described in the English papers, in the Queen Square Neurology papers. So that there was a lot of concern, particularly from the Scottish and the British, that the Americans had made up some new disease and given it the same name as what, the, as what their previous uh, disease had been called. And so there, there was an editorial published in the British Medical Journal saying that CTE, as defined in America, is not a neurological entity, but a cultural-specific social phenomenon. 
Um, and, and so the British were, were not amused, one might say. Um, and then the Canadians sort of chimed in, and they said, you know, we've looked at our players, and we don't see CTE. And that, that all culminated in, in February 2014 with, with a couple of papers saying, is CTE a real disease? So then what happened was, you know, you've got this Boston group, and you've got Bennett O'Malley's group, and then you've got this European group, and they're all saying that CTE is a different thing. Mm -hmm. So the NIH stepped in, and they said, okay, we need to understand this. We think that, you know, there is a real disease here that football players are at risk for dementia, so we need to figure out this, this whole problem. So they held a conference, um, and the conference was held in February 2015, and it was the first NINDS and IBIB consensus meeting to define criteria for the diagnosis of CTE. And what they did at this meeting was they decided that there were four types of CTE. So there was the original, um, there were the two um, subtypes that had previously been described were the original um, British types, and then there were two new subtypes that had been described from the American side, and those two were, were the other two types. Um, but the interesting thing was that they decided at this meeting that um, at least two of these subtypes were clinically asymptomatic, meaning they had no symptoms, right? So you can have CTE and not have any symptoms from it. Um, and, and so, you know, whenever, whenever a big news report comes out saying that so-and-so had CTE, my initial response is always like, well, you know, do they have the symptomatic kind or the non-symptomatic kind? Um, and then the other thing that happened right after this meeting was the British came back and they said, okay, if you guys think that there are four different types of CTE, we're going to look at our brain bank, which is the largest brain bank in the entire world, and we're going to figure out how many brains in that brain bank have CTE. So that's what they did. And what they found was, so this is a paper published in Acta Neuropathologica, Histological Evidence of CTE in a Large Series of Neurodegenerative Diseases. They found that CTE was equally prevalent, equally common in normal, healthy, aged adults as in people with clinical neurodegenerative symptoms. It actually had a, a slightly lower incidence, 11.8% um, versus controls, 12.8%. This is not a significant difference. Patients with CTE died at a mean age of 81 years, and most positive cases were likely to be clinically asymptomatic. So in other words, this whole controversy about CTE has now completely blown through the neurotrauma community, and we're no longer concerned that CTE is, the re is a real problem. Um, but in the meantime, the media hasn't sort of kept up with what's going on in science. Um, this is a paper that was published by the Mayo Clinic Group, and I'm sure you guys probably all heard about it because it was all over the press. But basically what they said in this paper was that contact sport athletes, regardless of injury, are at increased risk for CTE. Um, and what this group showed was that in 21 out of 66 former athletes, three had prior concussions and CTE pathology was found in, the, in that group of 21. But it was not seen in 198 non-athletes, of whom 33 had documented head trauma. But what they don't tell you in the, in the media release was that there was no association between clinical symptoms and CTE. So in other words, finding CTE in people who played sports is not really that important if it causes no symptoms. So, so we have to pay attention to, to what all this means. Um, and then this paper was recently published June 2016 in um, JAMA Neurology, and basically what this says is that CTE is not the problem. The deposition of tau, you know, everybody's sort of searching for tau right now. The holy grail is to find tau in living people. Um, Maybe normal aging. Um, and, you know, the, the problem with studying football players is a lot of football players take opiates. They take painkillers, especially in the NFL. And the taking of opiates or painkillers is associated with deposition of tau. So it's unclear if what they're seeing in these patients, you know, who, who have been diagnosed with CTE is actually the sequela of brain injury versus the sequela of opiate consumption. So, you know, basically now the scientific community is moving away from the idea that CTE is the problem, and they're calling it traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. So it, what they're saying is that um, brain injury causes problems, but these problems are not CTE, these problems are TES. And now the next step is to try and classify TES. So none of that answers your guys' question, which is, does football cause dementia, right? So that's what, that's what the concussion movie tells you. And if you watch the movie, you're pretty convinced that you should never let your child play football. Um, so let's look at the scientific literature. Does football increase the risk of dementia? This is a study that was done in, in um, Minnesota. 438 football players followed for 50 years and compared um, dementia risk 
to members of the Chorus Glee Club or band. And what they found was that there was no increased risk for dementia in the football players versus the other, um, other activity groups. And in fact, the highest risk for Parkinson's disease was in the clarinet players. Um, so, so obviously this isn't a, a large enough study for you to really you know, draw a lot of conclusions, and it's the only long-term 50-year follow-up study, but it, it does raise questions as to you know, whether or not football um, you know, is as unsafe as some of the media is saying that it is. Um, and the, part of the problem is, is that you have a lot of people who are doing research where you know, they, they open a clinic, they're trying to study brain injury, and they get a lot of people who come to their clinic who have brain injury. Um, and then they study them, and then they write a paper. But there, there's something that's called ascertainment bias that's tainting those papers. So here's a classic example. Um, these guys had a clinic. This is, uh, this is the Boston group. And what they did, you know, they opened their clinic, and they say, come to us if you played football and you have symptoms from it. So they studied 93 former football players, and what they show was that cumulative head impact exposure predicts later life depression, apathy, executive dysfunction, and cognitive impairment. But what they don't have is they don't have controls. So when you have an ascertainment bias, basically suppose I were to say, okay, everybody in this room, um, you know, if, if you have like near point of convergence difficulty, come and see me in my clinic, right? So any of you guys who has that problem is gonna come and see me. Those of you who played the exact same amount of football and don't have that problem are not gonna come and see me. So I'm gonna write a paper saying that you know, near point of convergence has a higher risk in football players without having studied all the people who played the exact same amount of football and don't have the problem. So you can't make conclusions based on studies where you have an ascertainment bias. And, so, and that's, that's really what the problem is and, and what the media has trouble understanding. Because you know, the problem is the, the, the universities want to get funding for their brain injury research labs. So they, they write a press release, and the press release comes out. And everyone thinks, OK, well, then this must be how it is. You know, it, it must be the truth. Um, and and you know, the media picks it up, and they don't realize that there's a problem with the paper. Um, so the interesting thing that, that, that I found when I sort of started looking at this question was um, football is the sport that's most frequently played by neurosurgery department chairs in there when they were in high school and college. Um, you know, so whenever I sit around at lunch with my colleagues who are, are neurosurgeons, um, I, you know, I ask them, I'm like, well, did you play football? And, and almost half of them will say yes. Um, so 33% of neurosurgery department chairs played football in high school. About 12% played football in college. Um, so we, we did a survey in the end, and there are 155 neurosurgery department chairs in the country, and 65 out of those responded. And you've got to figure there's a selection bias there, because the ones who responded are either probably friends with me or like football. Um, you know, so, so that's what you call a selection bias. That means that you know, the ones who didn't respond are more likely to have not played football. And what we found when we, we, we looked at the results of the, the, the survey was that you know, the, the numbers were this high, whereas only 8% of high school students and 0.7% of college students played football in high school. So what this means is that depending on whether or not you incorporate the selection bias, either 16 or 44-fold more likely um, neurosurgery chairs were either 16-fold or 40-fold more likely than the general population to have played football in college. So th these are really, really high numbers. And it suggests to me that there has to be some sort of tangible benefit to football. Um, there's got to be some sort of psychosocial benefit. There's got to be some sort of um, you know, risk-taking behavior benefit. Um, you know, obviously, neurosurgery is a risk-taking behavior, just like, just like playing football. Um, and you know, what do neurosurgeons do with their own kids? So 30% of children of neurosurgeons who responded to the survey have played contact sports. 83% engage in other risky sports. So in other words, knowing what they know about brain injury and its risks, people are still allowing their own children to, to play sports. And then if you look on, at their opinions on, as to whether or not um, you know, sports should be banned, you know, the neurosurgery opinions on banning sports, boxing, um, about 20% of neurosurgeons feel that it should never be banned. Um, you know, majority of neurosurgeons feel that it should not be done in elementary school, middle school, high school, undergraduate college. 40% um, of neurosurgeons would ban professional boxing. So, you know, neurosurgeons are not huge fans of boxing, I would add. Um, head hitting in martial arts, again, the numbers are very high. But if you look at tackling in football, you know, about 50, 45% are saying never ban it. Um, majority are saying ban it in elementary school, 
Maybe Bannett in middle school is about 45%, but Bannett in high school, undergraduate college or professional sports, very, very low percentages. And these are people who study brain injury and treat brain injury for a living. These are people who understand the consequences of brain injury. Um, heading of a soccer ball, again, you know, a, a large percentage saying never ban, ban it in elementary school, ban it in middle school, and very, very small percentages saying it should be banned at higher levels. Body checking in hockey. So you could probably still play hockey. Um, you know, I'm from Minnesota. Hockey's huge there. It's like, you know, it's like football here. Um, and, and body checking in hockey um, wouldn't substantively change the substance of the sport, especially at the lower levels where it's, it's already not practiced. Um, but, you know, the majority of, of neurosurgeons would ban it at the elementary school and middle school levels, and very few would ban it at higher levels. And then finally, off-piece skiing. So this, out of all the sports listed here, has the highest death rate, right? Off-piste or ungroomed skiing, and the majority of neurosurgeons would not ban it, which I find interesting. So, so really what we have to do now is we have to sort of look at all this data, and we have to think about you know, where we are as you know, brain injury people trying to help you guys um, and you know, trying to do what's best for our children. And I think we have to focus on the fact that it's really the brain injury that's the problem, not the sports. You know, sports are beneficial for children. Brain injury is not beneficial for anybody. Um, greater than a, a million American children play high school football. It's the most popular sport in high school. Track is second, basketball is third. An additional greater than a million play Pop Warner or other league football. Uh, like I said, it's the most popular sport. You have to think about what would happen if those children became sedentary. So for example, my son comes to me and he says, Mom, if you don't let me play football, I am not going to do cross country and I'm not going to do soccer. And he says, you know, I want to play football, and that's just how it is, because I'm not, I'm not good at soccer, and I'm not good at cross country. So I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at him, and I'm trying to decide if he's better off just coming home from school, maybe playing outside, being with his friends, not doing organized sports, versus playing football. You know, and that's really the decision that every single parent in that circumstance is going to have to make. You know, is, are you better off having your child be sedentary or doing activities on their own? Are they safer that way than playing football? And the reality is they're probably not. Um, you know, they're probably safer and, and getting more benefit playing football than, than not playing football. Um, my child wears a Fitbit, you know, he wears one of those little wrist things. And on the days when he has football practice, he gets between six and seven miles of additional exercise. Um, and you know, that's, that to me is not a trivial amount. Um, so if you look at the risks of, of becoming sedentary versus not becoming sedentary, there's, and the resultant increase in, in lifestyle risks, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, these numbers are huge. Um, and, and so, you know, you've got a population of children who are not necessarily going to be able to cross into another sport. And to take football away from them, in my mind, would be criminal. Um, and then there was a paper that was published, actually, in, in JAMA, that says even the obese child sees cardiovascular risk reduction benefit from sports. Um, and so, so what, what do we do now? You know, we, we've sort of got this problem where we do have risks for brain injury with sports, and we have it with all sports, but we also have it with football. And, and really, the, the recommendations that I like the best are from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to their website, they have recommendations on tackle football, and I think their recommendations are the most reasonable and well-informed. Um, really what they say, you know, to sort of bring it down to the essence is number one, follow the rules. You know, none of those illegal hits. And you know, I see it here, I walk around the stadium or the, the convention hall, and you, you see all the, the, the uh, attention that's now being placed on avoiding the illegal hits, you know, on, on playing with heads up, doing rugby style tackling. I think that's all incredibly important. Um, reducing contact drills and practices. There is no need for your children to be drilling their heads into each other. I know there's not a single person here who ever wants to see a kid hurt. Um, and, and you know, that's really the, w the way to go about this is, is to avoid that. Um, neck strengthening. So I was walking around the exhibit hall upstairs and I saw that there were several booths where they're marketing um, specific drill um, devices that help strengthen neck. Um, neck strengthening is thought to be the best way to reduce concussion because what it does is it prevents that fl flexion extension, you know, the rapid flexion extension of the head, which could in theory reduce uh, diffuse axonal injury. Um, nobody's actually shown that it's clinically helpful, but that's something that's going to be very, very difficult to prove. 
the best evidence that neck strengthening will probably be beneficial is the difference in concussion rate between um, girls and boys sports. So girls classically have less neck strength. If you measure neck strength on women, it tends to be less than that of men. And yet they're at higher risk for concussion. When girls go down, they're more likely to be injured than boys are. Um, and, and the difference is thought to be uh, due to those muscles. So I think that, you know, as coaches, you guys are responsible for doing what's best for your, for your kids. And I really feel very strongly that especially when you're starting at the younger and younger ages, this is something you want to pay a lot of attention to. Every single one of you guys should be doing neck strengthening exercises with your kids. Um, and then finally, we talked about the rugby tackle technique improvement, um, rugby style tackling. Um, and then finally, the, the last message from the American Academy of Pediatrics is when an injury occurs, a kid should have proper care. So, you know, there is a culture in football, and you guys know it far better than anybody, where you do play hurt. And, you know, like I, my kid plays football, so I see it on his team. They're, they're, one of their um, offensive linemen or something like that broke his arm during a play and kept playing. And, you know, kept playing on. And then in the, in the end, he came to the coach and he said, you know, I think you just need to tape this or something like that. He wanted to keep playing. Um, you know, and, and he, he ultimately, he, I think he even finished and played the season with a cast on or something like that. You know, there's definitely a culture in football of, you know, toughness and, and being incredibly resilient. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, except when it comes to brain injury. And really what has to happen is there has to be a recognition that if you want to play for the long term, if you want to do well for more than one season, you got to keep your brain healthy. So, you know, if, if it is a, a wrist or an ankle, yes, maybe you can potentially tape it and let the kid tough it out. But, you know, for the brain, there's no tape. Um, you know, so you have, to, you have to get the kid proper care. And the sooner you get them the proper care, the better. And, the, and part of the problem is, is that because brain injury is so poorly understood, there are a lot of people who sort of claim to have proper care and, and, and don't necessarily deliver it. And sometimes you have to shop around and, and figure out who in your community offers the best brain injury care. My only advice here, I'm not from Texas, I'm from Minnesota, is you know, if you have a level one trauma center in your community, that's usually the best place to get brain injury care because they're used to treating brain injury that's not concussive, you know, that's, that's not necessarily invisible on imaging. And the, the treatment modalities are very, very similar. So, you know, I, right now it's a hot industry. Everybody's setting up a concussion center or clinic, regardless of their credentials or training. But, you know, you want to get the right care for your kids. Um, what's next? Keep the end game in mind. You know, w when kids play football, they need to realize that really what the goal here is is developing healthy, lifelong habits. You know, 99.9% .9 of kids are not going to play in the pros. Um, the child needs to understand that they will play their best game if they're healthy, and they need to be incentivized to report injuries, especially brain injuries. Um, and, and so this, you know, is worth reemphasizing. When an injury occurs, a kid should get pulled off the field and get proper care. Um, and then this is sort of my favorite slide in this whole talk, and if you remember nothing else, you should remember this. Um, I don't know if you guys follow ESPN, but they had a really, really nice article this weekend on the relationship between a coach and a player and how it can enhance the performance of that player and allow them to have a very long and healthy career. And the example that they cited is, is obviously right here in San Antonio. Um, and, you know, this person, you know, has a, a, an incredibly long, healthy career because his coach doesn't push him to play beyond the injury. Um, sort of uh, threshold. Uh, the coach-kid relationship is critical. So I have a 14-year-old, and for those of you who have teenagers, or you know, you guys all coach teenagers, so you know this, they don't listen to their parents. Um, you know, I can tell my kid, you know, do this or do that, and, and he has absolutely no interest because I'm just mom. However, he does listen to his football coaches. Um, you know, when, when the football coach says to him, you know, you've got to take this seriously, you've got to do this or that, you know, then, then it works. So the coach-kid relationship is critical. You guys are the front line in the defense against brain injury. You guys are the ones who need to speak up and say, look, I think this kid's had a concussion. I think this kid doesn't look right. We need to pull him off and we need to, to you know, sort of get him assessed. Um, parents need to listen and care but not push. So you've got a lot of kids who are um, unfortunately living out the vicarious dreams of their parents. You know, if the parent wanted to be a linebacker in the NFL and the kid's 90 pounds and, you know, in, in 
12th grade and, and you know, doesn't have that sort of capacity, that doesn't necessarily mean the parent is going to surrender the dream easily. Um, you know, and, and sometimes I think the coach may need to step up there and say, hey, look, you know, we want to do what's best for your child under these circumstances. Um, you can't let the, the parents sort of ignore the injuries or push the kid into a situation when they're, when they're uncomfortable. If there is a good relationship between the parent and the child and the coach and the child, I think it's okay for the kid to play football. I think that they can take on the risks of brain injury because they know that if they get hurt, they will say something and they will get pulled off the field. Whenever that relationship is jeopardized, whenever you've got a coach who's too pushy or a parent who's too pushy and the kid is scared to speak up, then you're going to have a problem. Um, assessment of possible concussion. So, you know, I'm sort of going to, you know, talk about this a little bit more briefly. You know, everybody and their brother wants to sell you guys a, a what's it to either diagnose concussion, prevent concussion, or treat concussion. And, you know, maybe 30% of those technologies are actually helpful. Um, you know, there, there's no question that some of those things are beneficial. But the problem is, is that a lot of them are not validated and they just have brilliant marketing. So I have a, a, a diagnostic for brain injury that I've developed through my research that's based on eye tracking. And um, when we started our company, so we had to start a company in order to get research funding for this. And when we started our company, a VC comes up to me and, uh, and he says, um, you know, I, you say that you don't need baseline testing for this technology, but let me tell you, you really have to have baseline testing because that's where the money is. You know, you have to go after the worried well. You have to test every high school kid in America because that's a much, much bigger market than just the ones that have brain injury. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, you're trying to basically stoke the paranoia about brain injury to create a market for your product. Um, and, you know, that's not what I want to do. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in selling gizmos for the sake of, you know, making a profit when, when you know, there's, no, there's, no nece there's not necessarily an indication for that. And that's really what's happened in this field is there are a lot of people who tell you, okay, you got to do baseline testing for your kids. Um, the impact test is a classic example of that. It has, you know, there was a paper that was published that said that test retest reliably, reliability demonstrates that it was reliably unreliable. Um, you know, the, most of these tests that require baselines are not valid in children because children are developing. Their attention span changes, their cognitive abilities change, they're constantly evolving throughout their development. So when you're doing baseline testing in children, it's less likely to be accurate. Um, you know, there's, there's a new test called King Devic. So Steve Devic made a movie called Head Games, and if you watch this movie Head Games, you'll be convinced you should never let your child anywhere near any playing field of any sort because you're so sure that it's going to cause brain injury. So a lot of these people are trying to stoke fears of brain injury in order to sell you something. Um, and, and I personally think that's reprehensible. You know, I, I, I think that what you have to do when you have a kid who's playing sports and you suspect a brain injury, you have to essentially, you know, you want to do the most that you can. You want to use objective measures when possible. Those objective measures aren't uh, necessarily available right now. But you, anytime you have a kid with headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, vision problems, balance difficulties, forgetfulness, noise or light aversion, any atypical behavior, pull that kid off. You know, because you don't want to take a chance. And I, I think that you have to pull the kid off and get the medical attention. Don't rely on all these baseline requiring tests. Most of them are not accurate. Most of them are not reliable. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's really grown into a cottage industry. The best resource, if you're looking for tests that reliably detect concussion, go to the CDC website. Um, there's a, it's cdc.gov heads up. And there's a beautiful pamphlet that's been put together by Jerry Joya who's a um, pediatric concussion specialist, and it sort of weighs and ranks all the different tests for concussion. And it talks about the evidence for them and the evidence that supports you know, one test versus another test. And really, this is, I think, the most accurate and scientifically based source um, of information about concussion. Um, and, and, you know, it, th that's really where I would refer people, especially, you know, where I, where I don't know the medical community. If you're looking for information about brain injury, you should go to this site. Um, and they have separate pages for parents, um, for, for youth sports, and for, for school sports. Um, and then finally, I, I would like to end with, you know, ultimately this won't be such a mess. We will have objective measures that will define the problem. 
you know, normally when I give talks on brain injury, I'm, I'm talking about classification of brain injury. This is an eye tracking measure that we have in our lab, and you know, you score it, and as the score decreases, you're, you're recovering from concussion. Um, and these objective measures ultimately, in my opinion, will define the problem, and they'll, they'll make things a lot cl uh, clearer so that people can understand exactly, you know, when someone's brain injured versus when they have a neck injury or something else that's wrong. Um, you know, if, if we can define and detect the problem, then we can ultimately treat it. Um, you know, thank you. I appreciate all the hard work you guys do in working with kids. I know right now being a football coach is probably, you know, thought of in some circles as, as you know, doing something that's not helpful or, or good for humanity, but they couldn't be more wrong. I think that, you know, playing sports is incredibly important for children for their development, and, and you guys do good work. Thank you.